Hey everyone, how's it going? Matt Jarbo here, Stranger Days. We're trying something a little bit different with this episode. I want to try something a bit more, you know, off the cuff, conversational, taking you guys down a rabbit hole of absolute craziness while still maintaining some level of flexibility. You know, I, I was scripting these things beforehand. I was making sure that they were good and that they were scripted, but I felt that my performance I came across a little bit uh, less like who I am as a person and more like it was actually your performance. So let's see how this whole thing works out. If you like it, leave a like. If you're a chuckle fuck and you just want to dislike it because you're, you know, a see you next Tuesday, by all means, do it while you can, I guess. Anyway, I want to talk to you guys today about someone who is effectively known in Japan as the Twitter killer. This is a guy by the name of Takahiro Shiraishi. And he has been, at this point in time, sentenced to death for the crimes that he has now openly admitted to committing. But his story, his story is definitely wild because when you think of it, you think to yourself, man, this is something that like you would only see maybe in a movie. But this guy was using the fact that Japan has a massive suicide problem as a way to lure, recruit, and entice his victims. And that is disgusting. So let's find out more about Takahiro Shiraishi, the Twitter killer. According to many people who remember him, they say here, it's frightening how gentle and mild-mannered he was. This guy, 30 years old, this confessed murderer, led a quiet life to his peers. But secretly, he was a predator who trolled social media looking for his latest victim. And in 2017, he was arrested for the deaths of nine people. But where did he come from? Well, he was born in 1990 and he grew up in Zama. Zama is a city located in the Kanagawa prefecture in Japan, which is also the home to the United States Camp Zama Army Base. His father worked in an automotive design workshop with whom Takahiro had a pretty close relationship with. We'll learn more about that here in a little bit. But this only grew once his parents divorced and his mother and his sister both moved away to live closer to his sister's school in central Tokyo. You know, from here, his neighbors ultimately remember him as being a quiet child who was able to socialize pretty well, and his friends referred to him actually as a good listener rather than someone who would speak about himself. Basically, he was a quiet guy. He was the quiet guy who was introspective. I don't want to call him an emo but I kind of feel like there's a little bit of emo tendency there. You could kind of look at him and go like, he's maybe more of like the softer type fella in the group, but always willing to listen. And I'm pretty sure when it came to the ladies, he was probably always the best friend type, if you know what I mean. But during high school, he never missed a day. Punctuality was a thing for him. However, he wasn't the best student, like a C grade average. And physically speaking, he was a scrawny teenager with thin glasses, and never to be deterred by his smaller size, he actually joined the baseball team as a freshman and the track team as a senior. By all accounts, this kid came across as normal, as far as normal could go, I guess. He just seemed like your average, everyday, all Japanese teenager. <laughs> but after he graduated school in 2009, he took on some oddball jobs, working at a supermarket, like a pachinko parlor and a food factory before quitting all of those because then he became a scout for a prostitution ring. Yeah, so he quit these jobs, these, you know, let's be fair, these go nowhere, you know, minimum wage, right out of high school jobs. And he got racked up in becoming basically a recruiting agent or a pimp for some of the massage parlors in the area and brothels in the area. Now, what he did is he actually scouted sex parlors in Kabu Chico, Tokyo's biggest red light district, seeking to lure younger women into clubs there. And he was actually pretty well known around the area, right? He was well known on Twitter as being a creepy scout. And people were actually sharing photos of this guy saying, hey, watch out for this guy, watch out for this scout. So he was known in the area. So people knew who he was and he was a creepy fucker is the best way to describe it, right? But here's the thing, sex work in Japan is illegal, but they kind of look the other way which is how these scouts kind of tend to operate. But, you know, the opinion generally 
of Takahiro uh, seems to go against, like this particular opinion, seems to really kind of go against what a lot of people said about him. They, they call him gentle, mild-mannered, you know, and, and that's how he presented himself on the outside. According to the uh, boss of one of these Tokyo scouting agencies, right? Uh, that's a nice way of, you know, saying like a pimp. Well, let's be fair. It's basically a pimp. Uh, he said of, of, a, of a scout's job, just to give you an idea of what is going on here. He says a scout's job doesn't end when he brings a girl to the club. He's like a manager or consultant, negotiating her treatment and giving her guidance on getting money from clients to support herself. This relationship continues until she leaves the business. Girls nowadays tend to be in it for what they can get and are always thinking about moving to a better club. So they trust scouts more than the people where they work. It's pretty common for a few private words of advice to lead to a sexual relationship. So if you're the kind of guy that can't get sex, and let's be fair, I think Takahiro probably came across as a kind of guy who couldn't really get laid in high school. He gets wrapped up in recruiting women that he meets online through Twitter uh, to, to lure them into working for a brothel to, you know, massage parlor, things like this. He probably was getting a little something on the side, but he maybe started demanding it. Maybe he started pushing for it too much. That's where the whole creepy guy angle came from. But again, to everyone else, he was more or less like a pretty mild mannered dude. And this job required Takahiro to be a smooth talker with the silver tongue. And he would do that. He had those things. He would actually lure women into the trade but where he fucked up was he wouldn't tell them that he was introducing them to clubs that operated as brothels. So he would not tell them that they're going to become prostitutes. He would leave out that pesky sex work part of it. I mean, that's a pretty scummy thing to do, right? I'm all for legalized sex work, by the way. And this is a pretty scummy thing to do because he's false pretenses here. But let's be fair. The further we get into the story, the more we come to realize just how much false pretenses this guy did. Now, he was actually arrested in February 2017, the year of all this craziness, for violating the Employment Security Act. And in May 2017, he was given a 14-month prison sentence that was ultimately suspended for three years. So he never saw any actual jail time. But after the trial ended, he moved back home with his dad. And this is where things ultimately started to take a turn for the worse. In the months from February to May 2017, he kind of had a break. He kind of broke down mentally. That's the best way I can describe it. Because after he moved in with his dad, he told his father that he now no longer saw any fucking meaning in life. And this is the thing. Japan, we all know suicide in Japan is a major thing, right? You got the Akigahara forest, you know, the suicide forest, that whole Logan Paul thing from a couple years ago. It's a known thing. It's a known urban legend. There's even a shitty movie called The Forest. And it's a big problem. In fact, uh, it's a major social issue. In 2017, the country actually had the sixth highest suicide rate in the world, which was about 14.9 people per 100,000. And then in 2019, the country had the second highest suicide rate among major industrialized countries. Suicide is a major issue. And Takahiro knew this and he used this. And then from here, he actually distanced himself from reality. And he made his way deeper into the recesses of Twitter. Now, like I said, he used this platform as a way to recruit women for the prostitution ring. And now he was using it as a way to find women or people with suicidal thoughts. In fact, in August, you know, he, he claimed to be getting better, right? He, he had put some plans in motion, but he claimed to be getting better. And he told his father that he had met the love of his life and that he would love to have his own space. He urgently needed his own space. He needed a place to be with this love. Now, remember, his dad and him had a good relationship. His dad knew about the prostitution ring bust. His dad knew that his son was claiming to be suicidal. His dad knew that his son had problems. So when the son says, Dad, I found a woman that will, have, that will be with me. I need to be with her. We need to be in a place. The dad didn't question it. He actually acted as a, like a co-signer for this apartment uh, in the neighborhood of Zama, in, in, in another neighborhood, not far away. And, uh, and the thing was, it was like $227 a month was the, was, was the cost of this. 13.5 square meter 
apartment. Smaller than most damn studio apartments. That's what it was. It was literally just a room. But on August 22nd, 2017, this is when Takahiro moved into this small apartment with the love of his life that his dad apparently never asked to meet and implicitly trusted his son as a result. Yeah, you know, I get it. Parents are going to trust their kids, but this is where this is where shit gets real. Because this is where Takahiro put his put his whole plan into action. This is where he put everything into action. While living on his own, he built up a small following on Twitter through at least two different accounts. One of them was a I don't want to say so weird, like a pro suicide account that was just saying like I want to die was in his Twitter bio. And then there was a, another account that was pro helping people commit suicide. Um, you know, that had the title, a professional at hanging. That's what it said in the bio. Now pay attention to the professional at hanging. That's going to come back later. Under the first account where he was looking to die, he cast himself as a victim seeking company for his misery, saying to one woman here, I want to forget everything. I just want to disappear. And under the other account, he took on the persona of someone who was skilled at helping people die, saying, I want to spread my knowledge in hanging. I really want to become the source of strength for everyone who is pain. If you are at a dead end, please consult me. And then he, again, referred to himself as a professional hangman. Look, everything about that account screams, what the fuck? Everything about that account to me says, what are you doing? This is terrible. Stop it. You're going to like run all the alarms, all the bells are going off. But apparently because so many people on, on Twitter in Japan are, are in that particular mindset, that mind space, that headspace, this was something that he was able to do. Now, what he would do also is he would use the hashtag, um, suicide recruitment. Cause you know, that sounds fucking normal. And he used this on Twitter and he would prey on young girls who wanted to take their own lives. So he would surf around Twitter and he would find a young girl talking about wanting to die. So then he'd slide into her DMs and be like, hey, what's up? And he would say, and this is true, he would say, let's die together. You know, let's Romeo and Juliet this shit, basically. Now, to ensure his victims would not back out at the last minute, he actually arranged for them to meet him at a train station near their homes. So he would come to them and then they would travel to his apartment. And from there, what he would do is he would give them alcohol and tranquilizers and sleeping pills in order to make them relax before he raped them and then killed them and then dismembered them. That's what he did. Now, the serial killings at first went relatively unnoticed, right? But... It was actually on Halloween night, 2017, that the police discovered the bodies in his apartment. And the reason why they is because one of the women who went missing, one of the victims was a 23 year old woman whose brother had uh, gone and started to do his own sleuthing. Her brother wanted to find out what the fuck happened. Her brother wanted to find out where she went. So he dove into her Twitter account and was able to access it and found the DMs between her and Takahiro. Now, he alerted the police to the suspicious handle, which I'm assuming is the professional hangman, and ultimately was able to lead them to the residence on Halloween day. Now, when the media caught wind of all this, they called it an absolute house of horrors. And this is after investigators discovered nine heads along with a large number of arms and leg bones stashed in coolers and toolboxes. So this guy was bringing people in, killing them, dismembering their bodies, and then just kind of like leaving them in coolers, hoping that it wouldn't, you know, spoil or smell. And I'm not even kidding you. He actually would use kitty litter as a way to try to cover up the smell, right? That's what he would do. It's a terrible thing. So when he was busted, he ultimately confessed. He confessed to killing one person in August, four in September, and four in October. So, I mean, it was a rapid escalation. It's a rapid fucking escalation. And what he would do is he would kill them on the same day he met them. 
So he wouldn't invite them over and then let them get comfortable and stay a couple days or whatever. He would just kill him as soon as he met him. Uh, eight of the victims were actually women, mainly in their late teens to early 20s, in which case Takahiro actually said this to the police. He says, it was difficult at first. It took me three days to get rid of the first body. But after that, I could deal with them within one day. So not only was like he accelerating the death, he was accelerating the disposal because he was learning how to do it more efficiently, which is creepier than shit. Now, he also admits here that his motives were sex and money. I don't, I guess he would rob them. Maybe he would, I don't know. The articles, I could not find anything on it that specifically dove into the concept of like the money part of it. But the sex is what I think was there. I think he was rejected enough when he was in school. He was maybe even rejected when he was a pimp. And then this is a situation where he had full control and he was able to commit those sexual assaults. So this is what he would do. He would choke his victims and he wouldn't, like, here's the fucked up thing. He wouldn't even learn their names or ages. He didn't care. It didn't matter. He, he lured them there. He recruited them there. He got them there. He choked them to death or he choked them until they passed out and then he killed them. But this was also after he sexually assaulted them, like I said. And this is one of the, this is seriously, he actually went into some detail on this. He says, there was no doubt that I sliced up the bodies in my bathroom with the intention of destroying evidence. I disposed of their flesh and internal organs like garbage, but kept their bones out of fear that I would be caught. So he was literally removing the flesh, removing the organs, and then he was disposing of them. And again, like I said, putting kitty litter on the corpses in order to keep the smell down. But this didn't really stop the neighbors from noticing. They were very curious why there was a very pungent odor coming from the house or his apartment persistently and why his bathroom ventilation fan was running nonstop. I mean, clearly he, he didn't think this through right away, but he was accelerating it for some reason. I think because he wanted to get caught. And I, I mean, I'm not even kidding you. He would even to like dispose of the organs and the flesh. He would use the neighborhood garbage collection as a way to dispose of everything. Uh, one neighbor noticed and then, you know, admitted this kind of in hindsight. It was like, uh, it was a little fucking weird, but the, he saw this guy using the, the, the trash like constantly and didn't really question it, questioned it, but didn't say anything at the time. You know, noticed very frequent trips to the garbage chute. Now, when they went to trial, his lawyers at first tried to claim that he killed with consent, like a Dr. Kevorkian situation, right? Like, no, they wanted to die. They asked him to kill him, to kill them. Uh, they didn't care what happened to their body. You know, they it's, it's, it's an interesting defense. But here's the thing, like not one person believed it. Nobody believed it. And even Takahiro himself later on claimed that he just straight killed people without their consent. You know, but D, like, and I'll be fair here. Like, the guy's a psychopath. He's a monster. I'm glad he's he's busted. But the people who went there under that pretense were definitely people that were looking, they were looking for something. The only instance where I think things got a little bit crazy was that ninth person, which wasn't a woman. It was a man. And it was actually one of the victim's boyfriends. He killed both of them. So, you know, he definitely at that point was was really ramping it up and he would have had a massive body count if it was not for that that intrepid brother getting his Sherlock Holmes on and, and tracking it all down. However, because he admitted that he killed without consent, he was, in fact, sentenced to death in probably the most ironic way possible. Remember what I said about his Twitter account being listed as a professional hangman? Well, in Japan, when you're sentenced to death, it's by hanging. So there is a level of like car cosmic karma or cosmic irony or karmic irony, whatever you want to say. There's this massive thing there where he was claiming to be a professional hang hangman and he will, of course, be killed by a professional hangman. Uh, but when he was sentenced to death, he fully admitted that he would not seek an appeal, that he accepts his fate and that he is ready to die when the time has come. Because unlike America, right, where a person who goes on death row spends like 12 years on death row, it costs untold millions of dollars in order to be able to 
you know, go through the appeals process and the, and the legal remedies before that final uh, walk down death row is taken. Japan is totally fucking different. In Japan, once you're on death row, you wait and you don't know when you're going to die. They only tell you on the day you are going to die. That's it. You wake up one morning, it could be five years, it could be five days, whatever. You wake up one morning, they knock on your door and go, all right, now's the time. They don't give you time to prepare. They don't give you any time. They take you out back and they hang you that day. That is wild and that is also scary. But this is a situation where, quite frankly, I am, I'm okay with it. Takahiro Shiri Ishii is a monster who, instead of just taking his own life, decided to kill nine people and leave their heads in coolers and their, their body parts in coolers because he wanted sex and he wanted money, apparently. He earns the moniker of being the Twitter killer 100%. But it's so weird that this story isn't more prevalent at the time because even, even Jack Dorsey had come out and made a comment about it when the whole thing broke. And that's actually one of the reasons why they are now taking suicide commentary as hardcore as they are on Twitter because of this particular monster. So that to me is quite fascinating. Now, if you found the story fascinating, if you liked this breakdown of events with the Twitter killer, please leave a comment. Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell, and let me know if there's anything else you want me to cover, look into, and talk about. As always, my name is Matt Jarbo. This has been Stranger Days. I'll talk to you all later. Have yourself a great day, and peace out.